Hey everybody, my name is Angela Godwin and this is Water Talk brought to you by Water Online. I am joined today by my guest, Adam Redding. He is a technical director at Calgon Carbon Corporation. Adam, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, I'm kind of excited to talk to you about um, PFAS in particular. It's such a big uh, issue Absolutely. in the news these days. Now, when it comes to short chains, we have short chain, we have long chain. But when we talk about short chain PFAS compounds, right. is there any a difference between uh, granular activated carbon versus ion exchange. How does oh, that work? Oh yeah, absolutely. That's a fantastic question. Um, the first thing that you have to try to get someone to get their head around is what they really mean by short chain mm -hmm. or, or long chain. Because when we talk about PFAS, there are really two different groups of compounds there that get lumped together. In fact, there's thousands of PFAS compounds, but we talk about compounds that are carboxylates and compounds that are sulfonates. And when you compare activated carbon and ion exchange, and you just say short chain, you're kind of missing all of the um, the, the differences between the two. Mm -hmm. So when we think about a carboxylate, that type of short chain compound like perfluorobutanoic acid or perfluoropentanoic acid, it's a mouthful, but um, those are gonna be picked up better. The carboxylates are picked up better in the short chains by activated carbon. But when you talk about a short chain and now you talk about a sulfonate, it's a completely different ball game. And now like perfluorobutane sulfonates actually picked up better by the ion exchange resin or more preferentially, I should say, mm -hmm. simply because that sulfonate uh, negative charge is very well uh, bound or exchanged with the ion exchange surface. So you really have to ask somebody, what are you talking about exactly? But again, carboxylates better picked up by the activated carbon, sulfonates better picked up by the ion exchange resin. So there's everything, you know, devil's in the details, right? Absolutely. A lot of things to consider. Yes. So in general, though, if you're trying to decide between uh, granulated activated carbon and ion exchange in general, like what what are some other considerations that you want to have in mind? The, um, the biggest thing right now, our largest hurdle right now is how the disposal is going to be handled because ion exchange and activated carbon up front for upfront capital costs can be quite comparable. Mm -hmm. um, but then when you look long term and really every assessment should be a long term life cycle assessment, you have to keep in mind that at some point you're going to have to dispose of the medias or find a way to reuse them, you know, be it within a few years, within a year, maybe five years if you're lucky. Um, but in short, if you go with ion exchange, you're going to have to pay for at this point a very expensive incineration on the back end that can cost about a quarter to a third of the upfront cost of the media. So let's say the media costs you $300 or $400 upfront, that disposal a couple years down the road could add on another $100 a cubic foot. So it gets to be a lot of money and it's why you need a very encompassing uh, analysis of the cost. With activated carbon, the best benefit that we have right now is that we can reactivate it mm -hmm. and reuse it, which is both environmentally beneficial and also beneficial because right now the data shows us or is at least indicating that these compounds are destroyed during that process. So it's, um, again, like anything, you, you want a, a very encompassing analysis, mm -hmm. but you have to do the legwork up front to compare them. Usually that's a pilot study or some um, relatively involved bench scale study, but it's, um, as I like to say, there's no free lunch, right. but uh, you want to inc incorporate all the costs. And, and that's really the, the, the tipping point. Okay. All right. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. So the next thing I wanted to ask you about is something called a rapid small scale column test. Yes. Okay. So Another mouthful. why would somebody do one of these? What kind of information right. can be gained from it? Um, the, the RSSCT, again, another That's mouthful, a big acronym, no, rapid small scale <laughs> column test. And you hear it botched a lot, but um, I've been working on these since I was, uh, I'll say, a kid in grad school, mm -hmm. um, sleeping in the lab, running them overnight. I, I kid you not. Um, probably wouldn't be allowed today by safety standards, but nonetheless, no one cares it's a then. Different time. Right, no. different times. Yeah, different times. Um, it, it's a test method that allows you to simulate what would happen over years in a matter of days. Mm -hmm. And the idea behind it is that you're grinding up the particles, be it activated carbon, be ion exchange. And by running a smaller particle, you can accelerate the, the time of the test. So okay. what you might run in a matter of a week could be two, three years of full scale runtime. Wow. Problem with that, however, is though, again, the no free lunch issue is that you're not getting changes in water quality that might happen over a long period of time because you collect one water sample, you run it. But if it's a surface water, for example, that's changing all the time, right? It's different water in the summer than it is in the spring, fall, winter, et cetera. But it can give you at least a good baseline for how that media may perform. Mm -hmm. And what we really need to do, there's another step on top of that where perhaps the result isn't just absolutely predictive. In other words, what comes out of the test isn't exactly what will happen at the full scale. Mm -hmm. But what you can do is you can take the data from that test and use that to calibrate models, which you can then use to predict full scale performance. And um, it, the only issue that we have with it is that sometimes, like anything, it's a complicated test. The customer who's receiving it, the water utility may not fully understand what they're paying for. 
Um, at the same time, maybe the consultant doesn't fully understand where the hurdles or, or pitfalls are in the test method. Mm -hmm. So uh, like anything, you have to take it with a grain of salt, but it's a very good first step in deciding what is this treatment technology going to cost me? What performance should I expect? Right. All right. All right. Well, that's good stuff. Good. good yeah, to yeah, know. it is. Good yeah. to know. So the next thing I wanted to ask you about is um, bed volume life. Okay. okay. So why is the life in bed volume so much smaller, so much less in GAC systems? Yeah, yeah. That's um, yeah. It, it, that's also a point of confusion because if you look at the contact time that you use to design these systems, in other words, how much time the water spends in the vessel that it's flowing through, mm -hmm. simply it's the volume of the vessel divided by the flow rate will give you a contact time. Typically, we talk about it in minutes. Mm -hmm. If you're designing an activated carbon system per vessel, you'll target about a 10 minute empty bed contact time, meaning if there was nothing in the vessel, the amount of water flowing through there would spend 10 minutes in that empty vessel. And we, we use that as a point of normalizing what we're talking about and, and trying to have an apples to apples comparison. And what becomes confusing is that with ion exchange, you're looking at maybe two or three minutes of contact time because the exchange phenomenon is much further, or excuse me, closer to the surface of that bead, of the ion exchange bead, so it mm -hmm. happens more quickly. Where with activated carbon, you have to give time for the contaminant, the PFAS in this case, to diffuse into the structure and become bound in that, in that carbon grain. So because one's at two minutes and one's at 10 minutes, you have this difference of basically a multiplier of five, where if you're running one at 10 minutes and one at two, what is 20,000 bed volumes at 10 minutes mm -hmm. is the same as 100,000 bed volumes at two minutes. And really what you have to do is say to the person that's, you usually you'll see this in a presentation, you'll see a nice graph, breakthrough curves, yeah. and you really have to raise your hand and say, okay, well, are those at the same contact time? Because otherwise they're really misleading to you and the audience. And it's like anything, you got to do your homework and, sure. and just ask good questions. Right. Yeah. Cause you don't want to be comparing, you know, apples and oranges and oh, assuming it's that it's the same. Apples, you know. apples and oranges. It's, you know, right. Pennsylvania apples, Florida oranges. Yeah. yeah it's very different. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. All right. So let's talk about, so, um, the, the internal cone, right? Yes. Yep. Calgon carbon has this. Yeah. The, we call the internal cone under drain. Okay. Right? All right. So yeah, what, yeah. what kind of benefit Another does mouthful. that? Yeah. You, you're really testing <laughs> We're big on the today, mouthfuls. So, yes. Um, what kind of benefit does that bring? Oh, so when you talk about PFAS, we're looking at levels that are hard to comprehend for mm -hmm. what we're, we're targeting for removal, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at the current uh, EPA uh, expected uh, maximum contaminant level for PFOA, it's four parts per trillion. A part per trillion is one second elapsing in 32,000 years. I mean, it's a very small amount. So where that becomes critical in the vessel design is that you need a vessel that's going to optimize the flow through that vessel as much as possible because even a very small amount that short circuits through that vessel could be consequential for you the water producer because what comes out in the back end is now measured at such a small level that even a little bit of so to speak leakage or or short circuiting mm -hmm. is now going to be oh maybe this is breaking through already mm -hmm. and it really is um a matter of something that allows you in, in water treatment to sleep better at night because we're a relatively slow to react industry and uh and i don't mean that as a fault i mean we we carry a lot of responsibility right so we don't want to put anything out there that isn't extremely well tested and so when it comes to the vessel design the whole idea is that you're putting out the best design so that it will perform as optimally as possible so what it does is it allows either the exchange resident or the activated carbon to, to do its job because you can imagine that the media is only as good as the vessel that it's in mm -hmm. and if the vessel can't allow the flow to move very smoothly through that media you're not going to optimize the usage of the media. And one other issue is, and it's kind of interesting, and again, it's an issue that's even um, a larger one with PFAS, is that on your vessel side, you'll have taps, sample taps that allow you to monitor the progression of the contaminant as mm -hmm. the media becomes spent. So mm -hmm. it may be 25% of the bed depth, 50, 75, and then finally coming out the bottom. What you like to do as the user of that vessel is monitor that progression, and you'll see a very steady movement of that front. We call it the mass transfer front or mass transfer zone. But there's a problem in that if that underdrain is not well designed and that flow is coming in and short circuiting to some spot in the underdrain, it may not hit the sample tap evenly. So that predictability and how your media is going to be spent and really your ability to sleep well at night is compromised by that because you don't know what's going on in that vessel. So we really like this design because from our experience, both in terms of the performance with the media mm -hmm. and also that cone allows you to change out the media more easily, as you can imagine, because it's a cone, you open up the valve on the bottom of that, it will sluice out mm -hmm. relatively mm -hmm. uh, readily and you get a nice clean vessel and you refill it with new, new media. But it all gets down to allowing the media to do its job by having the best vessel design. It, sounds great. It's pretty simple, but sometimes it's overlooked, yeah. like anything. No, it does. It sounds it sounds like a, a very simple design, but obviously one. Yeah, that's it's very it, you can think about it almost like a, a colander. 
blender and you're trying to rinse out your spaghetti. Right, it, right. Or, yeah, it's it's pretty simple, but so, again, it seems like that gets lost. So. Oh, that's great, Adam. Well, thank you so much for spending some time thank with you us for today, having me. taking us through all these very complex, you know, ideas and, and treatment approaches. But you, you make yeah, it's it some sound, pretty nerdy. Make, it's some it pretty nerdy sense. stuff, but we we yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. yeah, appreciate it. So, if our viewers watching, if they want to learn more about Calgon Carbon or sure. any of the things that you guys can help them with or, or provide, where, where should they go? Yeah, it's uh, worldwideweb.calgoncarbon.com. Pretty straightforward there. Um, otherwise, you honestly could email me directly. It's simply adam.redding at curare.com. Uh, Curare is our, our parent company. Uh, we've been on, uh, we're on the U.S. stock market, but owned by a Japanese company now, but Curare, K-U-R-A-R-A-Y. So adam.redding, curare.com. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Adam, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Wish you all the best of luck. Thank you. For Water Talk, my name is Angela Godwin.